Well, hello, this is Mike from Music City. Uh, welcome to my latest installment of Rankin Records. This year, we're gonna look at the music from 1973, uh, which turns out to be a pretty awesome year in music. I I, I, I was just blown away. And uh, when I when I kind of looked at the releases that year and I started jotting down records, I, I, I was just amazed at all the great records that came out in that year. Let me just tell you some of the records that didn't make my top 10. It, it's just remarkable. Okay, didn't make my top 10. Beach Boys, Holland, Little Feet, Dixie Chickens, Elton John, Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player, uh, Tom Waits, Closing Time, uh, Faces, Ooh La La, Bowie, Aladdin Sing, Eagles, Desperado, Paul Simon, There Goes Ryman Simon, Mott by Mott the Hoople, Steely Dan, Countdown from Ecstasy, Stones, Goathead Soup, Allman Brothers, Brothers and Sisters, um, Band, Moo Dog Matinee, Neil Young, Time Fades Away, uh, John Prine, Sweet Revenge, The Ringo Album. I mean, wow. <laughs> and uh, But I'll tell you something, though. When when I went through and I kind of wanted to pick my top 10, it was just like, it was pretty obvious to me because, I mean, I just went to records that I really latched on to and, and listened to an awful lot in that year. And and the records that still to the, to this day I love very, very much. Now, We've talked before about, you know, a little bit of revisionist history <laughs> insofar as maybe, you know, things I didn't really listen to a lot in that year, but later, maybe caught on a little bit later and learned to love. And um, and the number 10 and number 9 spot are going to be two records that uh, fall into that category that I didn't listen to very much or didn't like very much in 1973, but I've learned, learned to later realize how important these records were. Uh, just, I think both were just groundbreaking records, good records, and uh, just, you know, had a lot to do and uh, an influence in a lot of people. And number 10, uh, the debut album by the New York Dolls. And I told you my love story with the New York Dolls. And I have a video ranking the records of David Johansson and the Dolls. I saw the Dolls in 73, was just too young to really understand what it was all about. Didn't really care for it, but man, what a groundbreaking record this was in terms of you know, really the, the whole punk rock, new wave movement. I mean, just a return to rock and roll and, you know, uh, just, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just such an important record. And, you know, classic tracks on their personality, Crisis, Looking for a Kiss, you know, songs that I just love to death these days. Just just a great, great, great record. Um, and, you know, didn't appreciate it much then, but certainly a groundbreaking record. Now, the other one, and, and and interestingly enough, this one doesn't have its own CD to itself because it came out in this twofer of uh, the two Graham Parsons solo records. But today we're talking about the GP record, which came out in 1973, Graham's solo debut after he left um, the Flying Burrito Brothers. And man, I tell you, what a fantastic record that was. So foundational into what we call country rock. Um, you know, he, you know, I keep thinking about, you know, what, what what makes this so special compared to what we call country today? And, you know, it's songs about romance, songs about relationships, song, songs about real things, not songs about, you know, the mud flaps on my truck or smashing beer cans on my head. Some of the crap that, you know, <laughs> we hear in the, they call country music these days. And, you know, he introduced to us on this record, the, 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 the talents of the great uh, Emmy Lou Harris, their duets were fantastic. He did some really fantastic cover versions and also some really, uh, really good originals. I mean, just just a totally brilliant record. Both of these records together. If you don't own these, go get them. But that's my, my number nine. Now, number eight uh, was a debut album by a band that I just totally fell in love with uh, back then. And I'm th questioning myself, surprised I didn't even rate this higher. But uh, I think back, and you may have heard me talk about, about this before, um, you know, I used to listen to WNEW from New York, Scott Muni's Things from England, and he played this record by the band 10CC. What what a great record this is. Uh, you know, it just really got to the what I really love about good pop music, you know, clever lyrics, you know, uh, harmonies, uh, you know, a little bit, a lot of tongue in cheek stuff on here. But, you know, the, the, the big hit was the song Rubber Bullets. Uh, my favorite's a song called The Dean and I. You know, great harmonies. You know, they 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 paid a lot of ode, ode to, to the doo music with songs like Donna. Uh, they, they were great musicians, great writers, and the, the talents that came out of this band were just remarkable. You know, Godly and Cream going on to their whole video thing, and um, um, you know Graham Goldman and Eric Stewart, just great songwriters and singers. And uh, man, just I I love this record and. Uh, 
you know, they had a they had a good good solid career too, and just still today are one of my favorite bands. Number eight, the debut album by Ten CC. Now number seven, an artist who a lot of us, including myself, have had sort of this love not love. I'm not going to say love hate love not love relationship, but his debut, excuse me, his 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 sophomore record, his debut album sort of went unnoticed. Uh, but that's uh, Billy Joel's Piano Man. Man, what a, what a, what a really solid record. I mean. Uh, you know, he had that first record, Cold Spring Harbor, which was strangely enough recorded at the wrong, uh, mixed at the wrong speed, and it just sounds awful. Uh, he's later, later redone some of those songs in, in live versions that sound a lot better. But, but gosh, uh, Piano Man was 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 and still is a great album. Here's here's sort of a reissue version I've got here that's got, uh, you know, some bonus live stuff on it of the era and. Uh, you know, I saw Billy quite often, you know, touring back then, and I, and I like to show he, he's a fantastic piano player, a great singer, great songwriter. And I mean, you know, you want to talk about classics. I mean, you've got Piano Man, you know, his signature tune, his autobiographical signature tune, and also the great Captain Jack. I mean, one of the best songs ever written about, you know, growing up and the difficulties of being a, a, a teenager. A uh, young and a young man, and um, God, uh, opening track, travel and prayer. I mean, just you know, gr great, great sound. Um, you know, the thing, the thing, what went, what went wrong with Billy? You know, my theory is, is you know, uh, he got when he got his his he got famous. He started writing some really, really bad sing, had some really bad hit singles, and and I I, I think he, he he in his live shows he would jump on top of the speakers and on top of the piano. I, I, it was like to me I, I always felt like he wanted to be Bruce Springsteen. He saw what Bruce was doing and he wanted to do that, and no, that really wasn't what you're about, Billy. You are the piano man, and uh, I saw you a few years ago at Madison Square Garden, where you know up until COVID he was playing a show every month for you know years, and uh, it was a fantastic show. You know he did what he does best. Sat at the piano, played, sang, and uh, spoke. He's he's a very charming, witty guy, and uh, uh, Piano Man's a great record. Now, uh, now we're going to number uh, six. And man, I tell you, back in the day, there wasn't a doubt who my favorite artist was, and it was Jackson Brown. And his second album for Every Man was one of his was was one of his best. It's it's a great, great, solid record. Um, you know, Jackson sort of had a reputation, had a reputation as a songwriter. And, you know, for this record, he redid two uh, of his big songs that were done by other people. Uh, Take It Easy, you know, which he co-wrote with Glenn Fry. Uh, you know, Jackson probably wrote 75%, Glenn maybe wrote 25%. And also These Days, I mean, which is just, a, you know, one of the classic songs. I think he wrote it, he was like 15 years old. Come on, it's ridiculous. But just, just a great album. Um, he, he really could rock out like the best country rocker with songs like Redneck Friend, um, you know, For Every Man, and uh, Ready or Not. Just very, very thoughtful, great lyrics. Uh, you know, still, still a great artist. I mean, I just don't ever think he achieved the peak that he had with the first three albums uh, that he did. But uh, For Every Man certainly, certainly one of the best albums for me for 1973. Um, Next, uh, I can't. Why can't I count? <laughs> Number five, and uh, gosh, uh, you'll hear this debated a lot. What's the greatest solo album by a Beatle? Um, you know, it's I, I, as I say that I'm 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 hesitating a little bit because I do I do love uh, George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, but maybe I will give the nod to the great Band on the Run by Paul McCartney. And is that Paul McCartney and Wings? Yes, it is Paul McCartney and Wings. Uh, what a what a great record! I mean, you know, had hits galore. Uh, the title track "Band on the Run" is just fantastic. Um, Helen Wheels, uh, nineteen eight hundred eighty five. Um, you know, I, I got to see Paul, you know, live back in you know around the time of this record when he did his first U.S. tour, and it, you know, it was a great show. Uh, this is just a, this is just a fantastic record, and uh, I remember. Uh, I, I I even think I mean I'm sure Paul Paul's biggest moment was when I when John Lennon uh, told him how much he liked this record you know as as the story goes and uh, but my fifth album and you know certainly one I know that most of y'all love being on the run now number four um, God you know this may this may actually be the record that I I played the most of in 1970 and 74 and. Uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest double record sets of all time, uh, you know, just in terms of consistent song after song being great. And that's 
Goodbye Yellow Brick Road by Elton John. I mean, to me, this was the last great Elton John album. I mean, Caribou came after this, and I just didn't think, uh, you know, what was, was as strong uh, as the whole previous catalog, but this is just a classic. Got to see, the, see him uh, touring for this record, and it was just a fantastic show. I mean, we've got 17 songs on here, and I mean, I, it's just like, you know, I, I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, from the uh, beautiful opening a uh, funeral from a friend, that little classical piece that goes into Love Lies Bleeding, right into Candle in the Wind. You got Benny and the Jets, the title track, uh, Grace Seal. I'm, I'm kind of skipping around a little bit now, but yeah, I, I do think this is one of the most consistently strong double albums in, in, ever, and it certainly, um, is it Elton's best record? No, I'm kind of partial to Tumbleweed Connection, but uh, I would say this is probably my second favorite Elton John album, and probably the album that I did play the most in 1974. Uh, now, here's a little bit. The next number three, I liked it back then, but I think as time went on and as I got to see the live show, I really, really appreciated the masterpiece that this record is, and that's The Who's Quadrophedia. What a brilliant record. Um, you know, of course, you're, you're going to say the obvious comparison. Is it better than Tommy? Um, why do we have to even make that comparison? I mean, Tommy was just so groundbreaking. I prefer Quadrophenia, I think, musically. I really like the fact that it's a really good rocking album. I mean, songs like 515, um, you know, uh, Bellboy, um, Dr. Jimmy. I mean, God. And and seeing the, seeing the live show, well, I guess it was in the last five years, just really reminded me how much I love it. And I, and I guess, you know, if you think about it, I'm, I'm not a fantasy person. You know, Tommy, yeah, a little... Kind of fantasy. I mean, this was more more of a true story. You know, growing up in growing up in England during during you know the, those times that were very very you know difficult for young people. Um, it's just um, just a brilliant record. Townsend's just a genius. Daltrey sounds sounds fantastic, and and the band is just so tight and so solid. Uh, Quadrophenia, my third album. All right, now number two. You know, you're gonna give me a hard time, but. This is my number one all-time guilty pleasure record. I mean, it's probably, and when we say guilty pleasure, it's probably something that you got to say, well, you know, not everybody likes it. Some people dislike it. Uh, and, and I think some people feel this way about the band uh, that I'm going to gonna show you here. And um, But it's just one of my all-time favorite records. And I'm sorry, it's, it's a record that I love to put on and sing to every song. Uh, and that's... Uh, Abandoned Luncheonette by uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates. I think, yep, yeah, yeah, this is their second album. Uh, it's got the immortal, wonderful, classic, probably one of the greatest soul songs ever written, uh, She's Gone. Uh, when the Morning Comes, just a beautiful song that kicks off the record with, with some great mandolin playing. Uh, Las Vegas Turnaround. Um, gosh, gosh, gosh. Uh, yeah, Guilty Pleasure. Uh, yeah, probably ranking it higher than most people would. Some people won't even have it in their list for 73. But, you know, I saw the band back then and, and have been a fan ever since. And, you know, they, they went on to a lot greater commercial success than they ever had with this record. Um, but to me, it is their crowning achievement. It is my Desert Island disc, if, you know, that I would take away with me because it just brings such joy to me to listen to and sing these great songs on this great, great, great record. All right, number one. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because you probably get tired of me because if it's number one, it's either going to be Bruce Springsteen or Elvis Costello. Well, Elvis Costello, uh, he, he was still, uh, I don't know what he was doing in 1973. His record came out in 77, so four years later, I don't know, he was still in school or he was still working at the factory. I, I can't remember. My Elvis history isn't as sharp right now. But yeah, it's going to be Springsteen. And, and uh, if you... This this to me is is truly remarkable. But back in these days, people actually put out two albums in one year. I mean, now it's more like I put out an album every two years or every three years. And I don't know how much of that's the artists doing, how much of it's the record companies doing. Um, does it have anything to do with the fact that you know when we got into the CD world, there was more song. It took more songs than it did back on a shorter single album. I don't know. Uh, the record companies. Is the record company is trying to milk the albums as long as they could? But in 1973, Bruce Springsteen put out two records. He put out his debut, Greetings from Asbury Park, and he put out the follow-up, 
the Wild, the Innocent, and the E Street Shuffle. Well, I'm going to call it a tie. Uh, his output for the year, I'm going to call this the, the greatest record of, my favorite record, excuse me, of 1973. Now, the first record, you know, I, I, I wasn't won over it when it first came out. You know, Springsteen was a new Dylan uh, kind of, you know, there was a lot of hype going on and it kind of, it wasn't getting played on the radio, believe it or not. And I just didn't really fall into this record until the second one was already out. But I mean, if you think about the classic songs on this record, you got Blinded by the Light, Growing Up, uh, For You, Spirit in the Night, Hard to Be Satan in the City. How can you not like this record? Yet we got to accept the fact it is not the best produced record of the Springsteen catalog, and and it could have been it could have been made sound a lot better, but still it's hard to uh, you know hard to criticize those classic songs. Yeah, there's a few songs on here that aren't the best Springsteen ever wrote. I'm not a big fan of Mary Queen of Arkansas or Lost in the Flood or The Angel, but you know if putting these together as one, but if we had to pick one. I think this album is brilliant and it would probably be my all-time favorite record if if Bruce Springsteen didn't follow it up with Born to Run. I just absolutely worship this record. Um, to me, there's one song on here that is just maybe not up to par with the rest and that's Wild Billy Circus Story, It's Okay. But I'm saying that because the other songs, each individually, are just absolute classics. Uh, the E Street Shuffle, what that funky workout of, of a fun song that's great to hear in concert. Uh, Sandy, oh my gosh, one of the most beautiful love songs ever written. Uh, Kitty's Back, oh my gosh, the, the best, one of the best guitar solos in rock history. Uh, Incident on 50, 57th Street, you know, Spanish Johnny, great story. It goes right into Rosalita, I mean, the best song to close a show in the history of, of live concerts. And then the song that I really, really think most people don't truly appreciate, it took me a while to really appreciate its greatness, is New York City Serenade. And when I got to see Bruce do this in uh, 2016, open up the show with it, I, I, I was crying. My, the tears were just pulling down my face. What a, what a great, great, great song. And uh, I always remember Disc Jockey in New York, Vin Skelsa, uh, would play it at midnight because it's got a line in there, it's midnight in Manhattan. Oh, and I just, just love it. But again, uh, to me, one of my all-time favorite records and my favorite record for 1973, Bruce Springsteen, The E Street Band, The Wild, The Innocent, and The E Street Shuffle. Wow, that went longer than I thought. I, I guess I had a lot to say about 1973. Again, a great year in music. And I hope you enjoyed hearing me walk through those records. Um, let me hear what you think about these records or other records that I might uh, have mentioned in that previous list or, or didn't even mention. And, and that's been one of the fun things about doing this is hearing uh, what you got to think. And again, thank you for your uh, support. Uh, we're up to almost 750 subscribers trying to get to the magic mark of 1,000 by the end of the year. So please, please, it doesn't cost you a thing. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, that way, the stuff we do will get into your YouTube feed and you'll be able to see it. Uh, we've got all kinds of things that we do. We do uh, looking for um, records. When I go shopping at record stores, I'm going to go record shopping tomorrow in Nashville. Have, we have something for you there over the weekend. And we talk about great forgotten records, uh, records that uh, I love, maybe the world doesn't love as much as they should, and I want you to know about. And uh, we do a lot of other things too. And um, so please support us, like us, uh, share us, and hit, again, hit that subscribe button. And it's good to see you again. This is Mike from Music City signing off.